We currently have some DDR5 comparisons, but all of them, or at least almost all of them, are with Intel systems since they were the first to adopt DDR5 RAM, not RAM frequency, DDR5 RAM, but what about the Ryzen 7000 series that also use DDR5? Are they affected a lot by the DDR5 frequencies? Are they affected a lot by frequencies timings? Does it really make a difference? Do you really need to care about RAM frequencies at all? Well, that's what I'm answering in today's video. In this video, you'll have a small explanation of how Ryzen works with RAM, about RAM Infinity Fabric, the FCLK, how it actually benefits the performance of Ryzen processors. Ryzen. And after that, you have the benchmarks. And if you don't want to see the explanation because you already know everything, you just go to the links in the description, not the links, you just go to the timestamps because you have those and you skip directly to the benchmarks. That's all I have to say. Without any further delays, well, let's go. Today's video sponsor is GGG Mobile. Where using my SKG discount code leads to a 25% off across several products, making a Windows 10 serial key only $16. After the payment, you'll receive the key in your account and all you need to do is to introduce it in your Windows settings and BAM! You have an activated system. Ryzen CPUs were launched back in 2017 and brought us a new architecture. That same new architecture called Zen came with an evolution of the Hyper Transport called Infinity Fabric. It is nowadays used in all Ryzen CPUs in the market and it is confirmed to be used as well in the new AMD GPUs featuring the RDNA3 architecture. In terms of frequencies, Infinity Fabric's frequency is directly connected to your DDR RAM frequency. For example, imagine you have a DDR4-3200. DDR is an acronym for double data rate, meaning that your RAM's true frequency is in fact half of those 3200, which is 1600 MHz. In fact, those 3200 are mega transfers per second and not megahertz. But that's a topic for another video, I guess. All Ryzen CPUs so far use Infinity Fabric, meaning that when using these CPUs, higher RAM frequency means higher Infinity Fabric's frequency, and higher Infinity Fabric frequency should technically lead to higher performance. The amount though is dependent on the Ryzen generation you're using. Older generations will get a bigger boost due to having higher inner latencies, while the new generation seem to not benefit as much due to the architectural improvements. The first and the second generation Ryzen CPUs had a limit, where you couldn't simply go above a certain RAM frequency due to the IMC, integrated memory controller and of course the low infinity fabric optimization. That limit was usually around 3200 MHz in the early days and went up to 3400 MHz with some BIOS updates when using Samsung B die kits. The third generation brought us the ability to use RAM frequencies as high as 5000 MHz. But it had a catch. As soon as you go over 3800 MHz on RAM, the Infinity Fabric decouples and will now be half your RAM's true frequency. So using DDR4-5000 would actually mean that your Infinity Fabric's frequency would be 1250 MHz instead of the usual 2500, making it actually lower than when using DDR4-3800, that would have an Infinity Fabric frequency of 1900 MHz. With the 5th generation, inner latencies were reduced, the CCX, the core complexes, were removed and all cores were inside the CCD and able to access the full 32 MB of L3 cache, meaning that RAM and Infinity Fabric frequency wouldn't matter as much as before. We also had some BIOS and microcode updates that allowed the Infinity Fabric to go as high as 2000 MHz, meaning that running DDR4 over 3800 on a Ryzen processor wasn't a dream anymore. Although the SOC voltage had to be increased a lot and the overall gains over the 3800 MHz systems generally wouldn't justify all the effort. After some years, the 7th generation was released featuring the Zen 4 architecture and bringing lots of improvements alongside the use of the DDR5 RAM. With this generation, the Infinity Fabric was massively improved, being its sweet spot 3000 MHz, meaning that you could run DDR5-6000 out of the box without the Infinity Fabric decoupling, with the possibility of reaching even higher frequencies with some tweaking. But there are several RAM kits below the recommended, with the cheapest ones starting with DDR5-4800. 
And will these RAM kits actually perform much worse than the recommended sweet spot of the DDR5-6000 or will they actually be very close in terms of performance? Let's find out. Today's first game is Far Cry 6 using the X12 and high settings. This is a game known to be pretty CPU and RAM intensive if you want the highest FPS numbers that you can get. And you can see that here. Even with a CPU as powerful as the 7700X, picking lower end RAM like the DR5 4800CL38 or the 5200CL40 will indeed bring considerably lower results, with up to 18 average FPS less at 1080p and 10 at 1440p. Not even mentioning the 1% lows that are considerably lower as well. At 4K the results are virtually equal as we run into a GPU bottleneck. Horizon Zero Dawn is a way more CPU intensive game than people think, and Ryzen 7000 series perform exceptionally well on it, even surpassing the new Intel 13 series in this title, and it seems that using slower or faster RAM makes absolutely no difference here, and I can tell you that we don't have a GPU bottleneck most times at 1080p, so if RAM made the difference in this combo, we would see the difference at least at that resolution. Overall, outstanding results with even the lowest end kit being able to achieve over 190 average FPS. Cyberpunk 2077 is a very demanding title and even at 1080p and high settings we run into a GPU bottleneck at around 130 FPS. The only small differences we see here are at 1080p on the 1% lows, where the faster RAM configuration leads us to slightly higher results, with the 4800CL38 configuration having a huge FPS drop compared to the others. Overall, even the lowest end kit could deliver a very good experience at around 130 average FPS with the CPU, which is great to see. Now it's CSGO, a game that relies heavily on the CPU to bring those juicy numbers, so memory should make a difference as well, right? Wrong! As you can see, the difference in between memory configurations is so small that it could be considered margin of error, as even 8 FPS here would be 1% of the average. Overall, if you're aiming to play CSGO, don't bother much about the RAM configuration and buy the best price performance kit available for you. Spider-Man is one of the most demanding titles we currently have in terms of CPU and RAM, this of course outside the RTS genre. In here we can finally see some differences with the DDR5 4800 and 5200 configurations delivering considerably lower results at 1080p. Mostly the DDR5 4800 as those 1% lows could be a game changer considering they're going as low as 72. In this game it seems that anything over the DDR5-5200 will do just fine, and if you're aiming to run this at around 120 FPS, even the 4800 configuration will suffice, but if you want those extra frames, well, I would look into a CL36 configuration, being it 5600 or 6000. Civilization 6 is one of those heavy CPU titles, in which I was expecting to see good differences, but it seems that the Ryzen 7 7700X is so powerful that in this game, even at 1080p and high settings only, it maxes out the GPU at 275 average FPS, making the RAM differences null. Still, nobody's gonna play a game like this at 170 FPS, let alone 275. The best solution here would maybe be to raise the graphic settings and enjoy the gameplay as it would be completely fine and always above 170 FPS if you were aiming at 1080p and 1440p. Keeping the CPU heavy titles, we got the Rift Breaker using the X12 and high settings. This is one of the few titles so far where we can indeed see a good difference in between the several configurations. At 1080p, both the DDR5 4800CL38 and the 5200CL40 deliver considerably lower results compared to the upper tier configurations, with up to 22 average FPS less and 18 in the 1% lows. It seems that anything above the DDR5-5600 will deliver acceptable results and if you're not interested in playing this game at over 140 average FPS and you think you won't notice the difference in the 1% lows, then even the DDR5-4800 would suffice. 
Hitman 3 is the last one of the CPU heavy titles using the X12 and high settings. In here we get the same situation as with the Rift Breaker, where anything above 5600 seems to do the job pretty well, with the lower end 4800 and 5200 configurations delivering consistently lower results. At 1080p we have a difference of 24 average FPS in between the lowest and the highest performing kit, and it seems noticeable even at 1440p with a 10 average FPS difference. At 4K, anything above the DDR5 4800 will do the job equally well, meaning that if you want to play this game at around 100 FPS, you'll be completely fine, even with a 5200 CL40 kit. Need for Speed Heat is one of the most unoptimized titles I've ever seen. Visible texture streaming, an explainable high load on the CPU and RAM, and extremely low FPS in most CPU configurations. And that's why I love testing it. I tested this game before with Ryzen 5 5600X in several RAM configurations, and the difference was a bit bigger than this, actually, maybe because the 5600X is considerably slower than the 7700X and uses DDR4. As for the results, at 1080p we only have a difference of around 10 average FPS going from DDR5 4800 to 6000, which won't be enough for most people to spend that extra cash on higher tier RAM kits, because if you want to play this game at 120 FPS for example, even the lowest available kit would be more than enough. Now it's some competitive games starting with PUBG using the X11 and high settings. The Ryzen 7 7700X performs exceptionally well in this title, with even the slowest configurations averaging 292 FPS, which is just insane. But if you want those extra frames, anything over 5200 will do it as well, as the gains start getting smaller as the FPS numbers go up and we enter a GPU bottleneck. But the most common would be around 120 or a bit more, maybe 240 for some users, and with the CPU, even 200 average FPS would be easily achievable even using low-end RAM kits, so I wouldn't really bother much. Almost reaching the final line, we have Rainbow Six Extraction using Vulcan and high settings. And once again, the Ryzen 7 7700X is so powerful that even at 1080p, the bottleneck is my RX 6800. Still, we're at over 310 average FPS, and even with those crazy numbers, the RAM configurations make absolutely no difference apart from the 6000 CL36, that brings slightly better results. Still, nothing that would be noticeable in real world scenarios. Outstanding results for the CPU in this particular title. Now we have Fortnite using the X12 and high settings, and let me tell you that this game is getting heavier by the day, with the 7700X being so powerful that it makes my RX 6800 the bottleneck here, even at 1080p. Overall, the CPU or even the 7600X are able to run Fortnite at over 250 average FPS regardless of the RAM kit you're using, which is a good thing actually. The results are all within the margin of error at all resolutions and even at 1440p ultra wide, where we can get around 160 average FPS, which once again is not bad at all. To finalize, we have the cost per frame chart for averages and 1% lows. As you can see, the configuration that delivers the best price performance is the DDR5 5200CL40, currently at $144. Although the real world difference in between the DDR5 5200 and 6000 is only about $30, which is nothing considering the full price of a gaming computer recently. In Europe though, we do have a different scenario, with the price difference in between the DDR5 4800 and the DDR5 6000 kits usually being higher than 70 euros, which in Portugal for example is 10% of the minimum wage. Overall, it all comes to your budget and how much you really want those extra frames, being you an American or European. So guys, as you saw, the differences are there, and although that for some people the higher frequencies might be worth it due to the, to the almost non-existent price difference, mostly on USA, in Europe, well, the price difference is there, in some cases over 70 euros, which in Portugal, for example, is 10% of the minimum wage. And that's a lot. Um, 
well, you can spend the, that in gross, groceries, for example. So it makes the difference in between the 4800 MHz and 6000 MHz. Now, is the difference really relevant? If you're aiming to, let's say, over 100 FPS in most games, well, you won't notice almost any difference because the 7700X, even with the 4800 MHz kit, will be able to achieve over 100 FPS, 120 FPS in almost every single title, even with cheap RAM. If you have the money to invest in something like 5600 MHz or higher, then go for it because you may be able to tweak it even higher and achieve even higher results. Uh, and these kits are usually way easier to use. You just go there, use the XMP and you're good to go or the AMD Expo and you're good to go. But uh, as for the lower end kits, well, they might be older release DDR5 versions and maybe that they can actually maybe harder to run on the AMD systems. It shouldn't happen, but it can happen, okay? Just saying. Just get a 5600 MHz CL40 or CL36 if you can, and if you just have that extra cash, go for the 6000 or even higher than that. Overall, you'll be completely fine with the 7700X with any RAM kit if you're aiming to at least 120 average FPS. If you want the max FPS you can get, then all I can say is buy the fastest RAM you can get as well because it will deliver those extra frames that you're looking for. Otherwise, you're good to go. And well guys, that's all for this video. Don't forget to like, subscribe and share this video because that really helps a lot. And see you in the next one. Leave in the comment section opinions and doubts about this video and, and let me know if you actually enjoyed this new format or not. Thanks a lot.